Um, as you know, my name is Mark Temple. I'm from the Campbelltown campus. And today we're going to be talking about DNA-dependent synthesis of RNA. So if you think about what we're talking about in these lectures, it's the, it's the, it's the synthesis of these l big polymers in the cells. So we've looked at um, DNA replication, so copying the genome, and now we're going to look at um, um, transcription, and then later on we'll look at translation. So, um, <clears throat> so the title for this one is DNA Dependent Synthesis of RNA. So if you think about templates and products, our templates can be DNA or RNA, and our products can be DNA or RNA. Okay, so we have four permutations on this title. We have DNA dependent synthesis of DNA, DNA dependent synthesis of RNA, we have RNA dependent synthesis of DNA, and RNA dependent synthesis of RNA. They're the four possible combinations, given that we've got um, a bunch of different organisms. We've got viruses that have, you know, retroviral, retroviral genomes, and we've got, you know, mammal, you know, so we've got all those possible combinations. So last week we, we talked about DNA syn dependent synthesis of DNA, otherwise known as DNA replication. Today we're talking about DNA dependent synthesis of RNA, otherwise known as transcription. Okay? So um, hence the funny title that the textbook uses. It's just to cover, there's four possible options, so in a very technical way they're describing transcription as DNA dependent synthesis of RNA. All right. So, um, so effectively, we're talking about um, gene expression. Um, so when we talk about gene expression, we're talking about um, DNA as, um, as information content. And how do you express that information in the cell into a form that's usable to the cell? So how do we get this information that's stored in the genome and express it as something useful to the cell? So that useful thing to the cell, typically we think about it as being a protein. RNAs are very useful for cells as well, so some um, genes express RNA rather than um, proteins. But we're going to be focusing on gene expression. So um, effectively, um, <clears throat> the information that's encoded in the DNA molecule um, is, is typically expressed as an RNA molecule, and then the RNA molecule is translated into a protein molecule. And you're all familiar with that. So the first um, stage in gene expression, which covers both of those um, processes. The first step in gene expression is um, transcription. So effectively, what is transcription? It's the um, enzymatic production of um, an RNA molecule from a DNA molecule. So the DNA is the template molecule and the RNA is the complementary sequence or the copy, depending on which strand of the DNA you're talking about. Okay, and we'll explain that during the lecture about which strand is the template and the non-template strand. So we're talking about um, making an exact complementary strand of RNA based on the DNA template. So um, there are three major kinds of RNA that are produced in the cell. Um, we have the ones you're probably most fami familiar with, which is messenger RNAs. So, um, so messenger RNAs carry the actual message, so the, the, the information content that's in the DNA, it's carried through to a protein through the messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA is what is going to be translated into a protein. So all of our genes effectively um, are transcribed to give rise to a messenger RNA. There are two other types of um, RNAs, which are equally important for the cells, and cells can't function without them. The first is transfer RNAs, and the second is ribosomal RNAs. So even though we're talking about transcription today, we're going to be looking at, you know, that there are three types of RNA that are transcribed from the DNA. Now, um, transfer RNAs um, are used in translation, so we'll revisit transfer RNAs in the next lecture because the, it's the transfer RNAs that bind to amino acids and take them to the messenger RNA during translation. So we'll talk about transfer RNAs next week. 
And ribosomal RNAs are also really important because they, they are part of the ribosomes. And clearly it's ribosomes that are the big machinery that carries out translation that we're looking at next week. All right? So we have um, um, three types of messenger RNA. Um, we're looking at the, um, the, 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 the synthesis of messenger RNA and um, yeah, there's three types. So, so j just to build up on what we know about um, DNA, to, to build up on transcription, it follows on from what we know about DNA replication because the, the processes both involve making these long nucleic um, um, acid molecules. One's a DNA molecule for DNA replication. This one's an RNA molecule for transcription. So. We're, we're, uh, much of what we know, we can, we can base it on our prior knowledge. So um, we can base what, um, an understanding of transcription on an understanding of DNA replication. Um, so the things that are similar is that transcription um, is catalyzed by a polymerase. This time it's an RNA polymerase. The direction of synthesis is identical. Okay? So RNA molecules are made in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, which we discussed last week for DNA replication. So the incoming ribonucleotides are added onto the three prime end of the growing RNA strand. Okay? Um, and just like DNA replication, um, transcription requires a template strand um, to, um, to, to determine the sequence of this, the new strand, because the new strand will be complementary to the strand that's being copied. And again, we have three phases to the process of transcription as we have three phases to the process of DNA replication. We have um, an initiation phase, an elongation phase, and a termination phase. Okay? Um, okay. So here are some things that are different in um, transcription compared to um, DNA replication. So um, by reference to DNA replication, I, I, was, exp I was telling you that, that um, you need to have a in DNA replication, you needed this extra enzyme that the primase to make that initial primer. And then that initial primer was then converted, you know, was then used to make the DNA strand because the DNA polymerase could not initiate DNA replication. That's different in transcription because the RNA polymerase can actually initiate transcription, which means that the RNA polymerase can begin by taking two individual nucleotides and binding them in place together on the template. And whilst it's holding them in place together, it can make that very first sugar phosphate backbone, um, that, that sugar phosphate bond. And then it can take the third base and add that. And it can initiate. So, so RNA polymerase can begin initiation of transcription. Okay? Um, when we looked at DNA replication, the DNA polymerase cannot initiate DNA replication. We needed the primase to begin. So that's one difference. <clears throat> um, when we talked about DNA replication, we were talking about replication of the entire genome in one go, in a very coordinated way. Okay? You, know, you flick the switch and you replicate um, the, 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 the genome once in the life cycle of that cell. With um, transcription, each gene is replicated on demand multiple times. So you can have um, tens of, you know, thousands or more copies of a particular gene in the cell, as opposed to one copy of the genome during DNA replication. So um, it's a much more on-demand um, process, and <clears throat> only one copy of the DNA strand is, is, is used as a template. Okay? So <clears throat> again, DNA replication, both strands are copied to make two parental, to, to make two daughter strands. Um, of double-stranded DNA. With transcription, only one strand is copied. Okay? Depending on where you are in the genome, it could be, if you think about DNA as having a top strand and a bottom strand, in one region of the genome, the top strand might be copied into a gene. Or an, in another region of the genome, the bottom strand is copied. The genes can be in, in various orientations in various parts of the genome. So it's not only, only one strand. So when we're looking at um, transcription, 
when we look at the gene locally, we determine which strand is the one that is actually the template strand that's going to be um, determine the sequence of the RNA. Okay, because genes can be in either orientation, um, so either strand may be copied, but only one strand is copied. All right, so here's a nice diagram showing the process of transcription in action. Um, so again, here's our um, double-stranded DNA, <coughs> and um, a short sequence of DNA is opened up. So this is called a transcription bubble, if you like, where a little bit of DNA has to be um, separated to begin the process. And once it's separated, we now have a process of um, the RNA being made. And you can, as, as shown here, the RNA strand is complementary to one of these strands. And the strand that it's complementary to is called the template strand. So the RNA is complementary to the template strand meaning whenever there's a G here, there'll be a C here. And whenever there's an A there, or A, there'll be a T, or in RNA, a U. Okay? So it's complementary. But the RNA strand, allowing for the nucleotide difference, is an exact copy of the non-template strand. So it's complementary to the template, but it's an exact copy of the non-template. So um, and we'll show this again in some more diagrams. I'll repeat that same phrase. Um, again, in a few slides' time. Um, so what's the molecular machine in the cell that carries out transcription? Um, clearly, we know it's an RNA polymerase, because we've said that already. Um, again, um, the foundation of what we know comes from E. coli. So this is the, um, the RNA polymerase from E. coli. And shown here, uh, the RNA polymerase um, tertiary structure being made up of five individual um, polypeptide. Um, so um, there's five proteins come together to make up the um, polymerase. We have um, two copies of an alpha subunit. We have a beta subunit and a beta prime subunit. And we have, I think they jumped to the end of the Greek alphabet here and went straight to omega. I'm not quite sure why they did that, but we have two alpha subunits shown here. We have a beta and a beta prime subunit, and then we have an omega subunit. And these five subunits together make up the core of the RNA polymerase. And again, you know, it's a, it's an, it's a, um, we'll look at a little bit about the structure function of this molecule, because its, its structure um, determines how it can function as a, a molecule, uh, a, as a molecular machine. So, I just showed those five subunits. There's actually a fifth subunit that comes into play transiently during the initiation of transcription. And the sixth um, protein is called the sigma factor. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, the, the sixth subunit. And there's the Greek symbol for, this, for sigma. So sigma factor, now it binds transiently and the role of the sigma factor, as we'll see in a few slides' time, it, it, it helps direct the RNA polymerase to the promoter sequence. So when you think about gene structure, um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but um, genes have promoter sequences, which are um, upstream of the gene, upstream, downstream, upstream. And then you've got the, um, and then downstream of the promoter, you've got the first exon. And then you go into the introns and exons and introns and exons as you go through the gene. So the sigma factor is going to bind to uh, uh, these particular sequences in the promoter region. And each gene has its own promoter. So the sigma factor is helping the, the polymerase decide which genes are going to be turned on at, at a particular time. And, and you put all the, of these six subunits together, and you have what's called the um, RNA polymerase holoenzyme, meaning it, the big thing with all, all six things in place. Okay. In the same way that we had a, um, a DNA holoenzyme, but a DNA polymerase holoenzyme, when all of these proteins start to come together to make the actual thing that can do its job.
Okay, so I've described to you that there were three types of messenger RNA, uh, of, of RNA, with the messenger RNA, the transfer RNA, and the ribosomal RNA. Three types of RNA that are made. Um, we also have three types of polymerases in, in um, eukaryotic cells. Um, and unimaginatively, but makes it easy to remember, they are referred to as RNA polymerase 1, RNA polymerase 2, and RNA polymerase 3. Okay? So I'll jump first to RNA polymerase 2. RNA polymerase 2 is the, is the RNA polymerase that transcribes most of the genes that make RNA. So um, Paul 2 recognizes the promoters of the messenger RNA, or, 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 of, or, of genes that, that give rise to messenger RNA. So most of the proteins that are made in cells are made by the RNA polymerase 2 because it recognizes the promoters of, um, of, of, of the genes. RNA polymerase 1 is, one of, is a polymerase that pretty much just transcribes the large ribosomal RNA precursors. Okay? So let me just unconstruct that sentence a bit. We have RNA precursors. So RNA molecules are made as um, the, 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 the large RNA is transcribed and then that large trans RNA transcript is cleaved to make smaller RNAs. And those smaller RNAs then go into the ribosome. Okay? So that's all it means by the, the idea of an RNA precursor. So it's still an RNA molecule. It's just a large RNA that will be cleaved later on in, in the cell. And then those products will come together to make the ribosome. So the, ribosomal, the large ribosomal genes are transcribed by RNA polymerase 1. And it, if you think about it, it's probably not, it makes sense that there's, I mean, there's only a few, a handful of RNA, of ribosomal RNAs that are in the cell. There's only a few of them, okay? So why would just a couple of RNA genes, if you like, have their own polymerase? Well, the ribosomes are present in cells in really high numbers. So there's an awful lot of ribosomal RNA that is transcribed. So it seems there's a polymerase that does this job to make this awful large amounts of ribosomal RNA that's present in cells. If, you, if you're working at the bench and you're doing an, an RNA extraction and you get your cells and you, you carefully break your cells up and you extract the RNA and then you run the RNA on a gel, you'll see big peaks, which are the ribosomal RNA peaks, and your messenger RNAs just these tiny, tiny little peaks hidden in, 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 the, in, in the background. So, so the ribosomal um, RNAs are made in large quantities, and there's only a couple of them, and they have their own polymerase. There's lots of messenger RNAs made, but they're all different sizes, and, you know, they... they um, and the, the other polymerase that exists is uh, um, RNA polymerase 3. And polymerase 3, um, according to the textbook, tends to make um, these transfer RNAs, and there's, um, there's 20 or 30 transfer RNAs, I forget the exact number, um, for um, bringing in the amino acids to translate to in translation. So we have these small transfer RNAs. And some of the, um, the, the 5S, which is the small ribosomal um, RNA, and some small nuclear RNAs. So again, RNA polymerase 3 and RNA polymerase 1 aren't responsible for transcribing the genes that make the proteins in our cells. They, they have their own roles in the cell and they have their own genes that they transcribe. And it's RNA polymerase 2 that does um, um, the, the, the job of gene expression in terms of making proteins. So. So uh, again, just some of the characteristics of the um, of the RNA polymerase, it requires magnesium ions. Now, we didn't discuss this when we were looking at DNA replication, but DNA polymerase also requires magnesium ions. Okay? So part of that process of making a sugar phosphate backbone, the enzyme requires a, um, a positively charged metal ion in the catalytic site, and it uses that charged center to help it make the bond. Okay? So polymerases require magnesium um, ions, um, and that's true for the RNA polymerase. Um, 
the, the polymerase requires four ribonucleotides, and they are in ATP, GTP, CTP, and UTP rather than TTP because um, that's the, they're, the, they're the nucleotides that are used to make RNA. And, um, and the chemistry and mechanism of making the, the double bonds and the, the, the base pairing between the template and the incoming nucleotide are all pretty similar to what we've observed in DNA replication. So I put this up as a reminder to you because I know when I'm teaching um, proteins and genes and I walk around the lab and talk to people about sugars and things, there's often not much of an understanding of sugars and I don't think you appreciate how important it is to understand sugars when we're looking at these kinds of um, processes. So I've just drawn here a ribo sugar for your, to remind you. So it's, it's got five carbons, one, two, three, four, five. So um, in um, the, 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 the nitrogenous base, the C, T, A, and G, they, they, they attach to the, the one prime. And then, um, and on the five prime here, you have the, um, the triphosphate attached or monophosphate, depending on what stage it's at. And then on the three prime is where you join a bond to the, previous, to the next nucleotide. So, so the sugar phosphate backbone alternates five prime, three prime, five, you know, five, three, five, three, five, three. And the five prime end of the molecule has this exposed, and the three prime end of the molecule has that exposed. And it's at the three prime end of the molecule that you can extend and add the next nucleotide. So the incoming nucleotide will be added here. And this is um, deoxyribose. So this is the, 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 the ribose sugar that's involved in DNA um, as a building block for DNA. And it has a hydrogen here on the two position. In RNA, we have an OH here, obviously. So this is, um, this is just plain old ribose sugar rather than deoxyribose sugar. And um, the, the, so all of the sugars involved in, in um, RNA have a OH group on the two prime here. It's just, so that's just a bit of a, a refresher on sh ribose sugars from proteins and, proteins and genes. Um, yeah, all right. So. Okay, so we're now just discussing the, uh, the um, polymerization here. And as I've already um, expressed to you, the, um, the growing strand of RNA is built up at the three prime end. So incoming nucleotides are added at the three prime hydroxy, and the strand grows in the five prime to three prime direction. And clearly, the template strand that's being read is anti-parallel to the newly synthesized RNA strand. So the RNA, so the template strand runs in the opposite direction because double-stranded DNA is always anti-parallel, even if it's a short sequence of double-stranded at the point where transcription's occurring, it's still anti-parallel, even though it's only, what well, we'll see in the diagrams, there's only eight or 10 base pairs between the RNA and the DNA, but it's still anti-parallel. It's the only way you can get complementary base pairing. And each nucleotide that's incoming to be added to the newly growing strand is, is partly selected by the Watson Creek base pairing. So typically G and C, in DNA we had A and T, in RNA we have A and U. So the A bases on the DNA are complementary to the U bases on the um, RNA. And here's just a little figure from the textbook which shows RNA synthesis in action. So at the top here in orange, we've got the template um, DNA strand, and that goes in the three to five prime direction, from here to here. And the newly made strand is in the five to three prime direction, with the three prime end where the business end of transcription is occurring. So the newly incoming nucleotide is added on to the three prime hydroxy. And we talked about DNA replication how the three prime hydroxy is the nucleophilic center that attacks the incoming nucleotide on the alpha phosphate and all that kind of stuff. Same story here because it <clears throat> so here's the incoming nucleotide here. <clears throat> I like the way the textbook shows the, the three phosphates as being really huge relative to the rest of the nucleotide. So 
these are shown disproportionately large in this diagram just to highlight what's happening. So we're getting a <coughs> hydrophilic attack from the 3 prime hydroxy onto the alpha phosphate to break this bond here and then this is attached to there to make a bond to extend this sugar phosphate backbone to include the new nucleotide. And here we've got complement complementary base pairing between the T and the A. So, um, yeah, okay. And um, if we were base pairing here, it would be the U base pairing with the, the A because in RNA we don't have Ts, we have Us. So we have a T in the DNA making an A, and then we have, when we run into the A, it will code for a U as we have here. All right, so um, basically this bit is identical to DNA replication functionally in, in terms of the way the incoming nucleotide is added and how the bond is made. And this is just showing the um, position of these magnesium ions in the, um, in the reaction. And it's just the, the, the strong positive charge here somehow in a way that I don't understand because I'm not a chemist, I'm a molecular biologist, but I know that the magnesium ion is important to, um, to, to form this bond here. And without the magnesium ions, the polymerase cannot make, extend the chain. So if you're in the lab again and you're doing, a, a, um, doing any kind of biological assay, you usually have to titrate the amount of magnesium to get it just right to make the polymerase work. But you guys are the kit generation, so when you do a, a, a DNA re reaction, whether it be a, some sort of PCR or something, you know, you get the kit out of the, the freezer and you just mix the reagents and push go. Whereas in my day, companies didn't provide these kits, so we had to get the polymerase and get the nucleotides, get the magnesium, and spend days working out how much of each you need to put together to make the damn reaction work. So, you know, in my day, it was like, woohoo, I've made a, a, a PCR reaction work. And it took me, you know, X many weeks. Whereas you guys just go, oh, I'll get this kit that's been pre-optimized from the company and I'll just do, 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 and it should work. So count yourself lucky. There's lots of other things you can spend your time optimizing and, and doing in the lab rather than trying to make a PCR reaction work. And uh, whilst we can sort of just unwind our brain for a couple of seconds, um, I can tell you, when I was an honor student, um, one of my fellow honor students was doing a PCR reaction, PCR reaction. And to do the PCR reaction, this is in the days when PCR was new and thermal cyclers were not commercially available. They didn't exist. So to do a PCR reaction, you'd surround yourself with four baths, water baths. You'd have one water bath at, say, 60 degrees, one at 72 degrees, one boiling, and you'd have an ice bucket behind you. And you put your tubes into the 95-degree um, the water bath to try and denature the DNA. Then you put your tubes in the annealing water bath at 60 degrees to try and get the thing to bond, the, the primers. And then you put it into the 72 degrees one to get it to extend. And then you go back in. So you'd spend your time being the PCR machine. And to, to do a PCR might take you four hours of sitting there moving your tubes around. But don't forget, you know, you'd spend weeks and weeks and weeks trying to optimize how much nucleotide and how much magnesium. So this poor student spent eight months doing one, optimizing one PCR reaction and getting it to work and getting a bit of sequence. Whereas you guys can do that now in like half an hour in the lab. So it's a different world you live in, but it was exciting times doing your first PCR reaction because it was done, you know, in a, in a very inventive way with a poor student who was actually the PCR machine. Anyway, I just thought we'd have a quick digression where we can stop thinking for a couple of seconds. Um, so let's re-engage our brains with the lecture content. Okay, so, um, so RNA synthesis and extension is functionally very similar to DNA extension with um, the, the, the chain growing at the three prime end. And yeah, and I should also point out that this gray bit at the bottom here is actually showing a little bit of the RNA polymerase molecule. So the polymerase is encompassing this whole thing. So it's all happening within the polymerase. Okay, so um, 
when we're doing DNA replication, both strands are being copied. So um, we had this big thing copying both strands at the replication fork. At um, transcription, we have two strands of DNA, and only one of those strands is going to be replicated. So with the terminology we use, um, there's actually two terminologies, depending on whether you get, I don't, I'm not sure if it's an American textbook versus an English textbook, or whether it's an older textbook versus a newer textbook, but there's different terminologies. So we have this nomenclature of a template strand and a non-template strand. So, um, and we have this alternate one where we have a coding strand or a non-coding strand. So depending on which textbook you're reading or which website you're going to, you'll read about template and non-template DNA or coding and non-coding um, DNA strands. And depending on where you are in the genome, the, the top strand could be the coding strand or the bottom strand can be the coding strand. Okay? It's all relative to that gene and it's relative to the orientation of what's going on at that part of the genome within that particular promoter. Okay? So we have two strands. We have um, non-template, template, or coding, non-coding strands of DNA. And it's a local description rather than a, a genome-wide description. And from one of these strands, we make a, an RNA strand. And if you look here, the RNA strand here is written in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Okay? So the RNA strand is identical to the coding strand or the non-template strand. So G, A, C, G, G, A, C, G. Where you've got T's in DNA, you've got U's in RNA. So, the, um, so this strand here, the non-template DNA, is identical to, in sequence to the messenger RNA. Now if it's identical to the RNA, clearly that's not the strand that's being copied. Because when you make a t another strand, you make a complementary copy. Whether it's DNA and RNA, you make a complementary copy, not an exact copy. So this strand here, shown in red, is the strand that is actually copied by the polymerase. This is where the polymerase binds to the template strand, and it makes a complementary sequence. So whenever there's a C in the template strand, you get a G in the strand that's being copied. So it's complementary to the template strand, but identical to the non-template strand. Okay? So if you just think it through, it's not confusing, but I can guarantee at some point when you're at the bench or doing something, it'll be confusing until you rationalize it again and go, that's right, that's how I remember it. Okay? So, um, okay. so, so this is the same information, but just written now written out on the slide. The template strand serves as the actual template for RNA synthesis, and it's complementary to what's being made. And the non-template strand, otherwise known as the coding strand, is identical in sequence to the RNA. Um, and then it's just in very small sort of, you know, the, the diagram, the textbook that just shows that here. So this is just, have I got, let me just see if I've got a bigger version of this. No. So, so what's shown here is, again, um, the RNA strand being identical to the top strand and complementary to the bottom strand. The bottom strand being the template, because the template is, means it's going to be copied. So that's what template means. Um, and the non-template strand is the top one, which is identical to the RNA. What's also shown here in the, um, in the the top, the top strand here, the coding strand, is the ATG, which can either be a methionine in a protein or it can be the start codon. So transcription start, <coughs> translation starts from a particular um, codon, and that's shown here. And that's, that, that trans, ATG translates to AUG. And we'll look at that next week when we're talking about translation. <coughs> So at the region where the complementary RNA strand is being actually made, um, we have the DNA duplex must be unwound. Okay? And when we unwind the bit of DNA at the promoter region of the gene, we, re we refer to the unwound DNA as a transcription bubble. So the two strands of DNA have opened up, and they call it a bubble. 
and <clears throat> approximately 17 base pairs of DNA are unwound at the bubble. Okay? And don't forget, that bubble is going to be sliding along the DNA. That, double, that bubble moves because transcription has to move along the gene to read the gene. So as the RNA is moving through the gene, this region that's open moves through the gene. So uh, it's not as if the whole gene is unwound to be copied. Only a small region of the double-stranded DNA is, is, is separated and opened at any one point in time. And that's called a bubble, and the bubble kind of moves through. So the bubble is where the polymerase is. Effectively, the, the polymerase causes this bubble, and as the polymerase moves through the double-stranded DNA, this open bubble moves through the DNA. So during elongation um, at this bubble, there'll be a short sequence of DNA-RNA hybrid um, in place. So again, when we did DNA replication, the, 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 the strand was copied and the strand was intact the entire way. But what happens in um, transcription, there's only about eight base pairs of the, the RNA that's being made is actually attached to the DNA and then it's peeled off and separated out so that the RNA comes out of the polymerase as a single strand. And I've got some diagrams that show this. So a moving RNA polymerase Again, it causes positive supercoils ahead of it, and it causes negative supercoils behind it. So whenever you're sort of unwinding a bit of DNA, you've got to introduce torsional stress or reduce tor torsional stress. So whenever you separate strands, remember that analogy about the shoelaces, and you try and untangle it, and it causes more winding ahead of it. Same process here, that we have the introduction of um, either um, positive or negative supercoils, meaning it's either overwound or underwound, depending on where um, it is relative to the polymerase. So I showed this um, a little bit earlier. This is just um, showing the RNA strand that's being synthesized. So this is the RNA bubble. This bubble will move through the, the gene here, and um, it will transiently be opened. And this will be keep peeling out, and only eight base pairs will be attached to any one time. So as a new nucleotide is added to the three prime end, the strand is peeled off one nucleotide here. New nu nucleotide is added on the three prime end, another one's peeled off. So there's only ever about eight base pairs attached at any one point in time. And the bubble's only about 20 base pairs of open DNA at any one point in time. Okay. So that's just putting this large um, RNA polymerase hollow enzyme in place now around the DNA. And you can see that um, this bubble is made within the polymerase, or you know, uh, it's associated with the polymerase. And as the polymerase moves forward, this bubble stays, you know, it, it physically separates the two strands. And as the polymerase moves forward, the RNA is peeled out through this channel between the subunits here. And it, at the movement of the polymerase, it causes positive supercoils or overwinding ahead of it, and it introduces underwinding or negative supercoils behind it. So um, you get this, wind, you know, this winding of the DNA occurring. So this is just showing. Um, for some reason, the textbook just flipping the, the, looking at the other side of the polymerase. Now, I don't know why it's showing the polymerase in two orientations, just to confuse you and make it a little bit more complex than it really needs to be. But if you just take that, that structure and flip it around, then you get that kind of structure there. So again, this just shows um, that there's a channel. I think that channel is between subunits. I don't think it's within a subunit, but I, I, can't, I can't tell from this diagram because it's not showing the individual subunits here. It's showing the polymerase as one thing but we know it's made up of five individual subunits. So there's a channel here, and the RNA, plumer, the RNA strand is physically pushed into this channel, and it just, it just comes out as a single strand of bit of DNA. And then, you know, and the, there's the, the, the transcription bubble where extension of the, plumer, the RNA is occurring. So... So during synthesis of the RNA strand, 
We cause um, topological stress by move, movement of the um, polymerase. And whenever you've got topological stress, it will stop the movement of the polymerase unless you relieve that topological stress. So there's a topo isomerase involved that cuts the one strand of the DNA, lets it re, you know, untangle its supercoils, and then reattaches it. So um, if I think back to my junior school maths, like in England you have primary school, junior school, senior school, so in my middle school, um, I remember doing topological transformations in maths. And it was just meaning that if you took a square and you shifted that square, it became a trapezoid. You know, it changed shape. But it didn't change the dimensions of that shape. It just changed it. And that was topological transformations. So I guess topological stress, you know, we're not changing the DNA in any real way. It's not as if we're adding to it or taking away. We're just making, you know, cleaving it, letting it unwind, and then reattaching it. So it's the same molecule afterwards. It doesn't cause any change to the DNA. I'm not quite sure why it's called a topo I summarize, but I assume it's something to do with that concept d derived from, you know, some Latin word probably. Okay, so, um, so the rate of elongation, the rate at which transcription proceeds, is about 50 to 90 nucleotides per second. So if you think about it, 100 nucleotides per second, it's pretty damn fast. So this molecule is getting a nucleotide, bringing it in, aligning it to the template strand, making a bond, and then shifting along one base pair, grabbing another nucleotide, bringing it in, making a bond, it's doing that 100 times a second. So I, I have trouble understanding the mechanics of such small things, because maybe just, you know, maybe it's not a big deal to do that 100 times per second in the molecular, you know, frame, you know, scale, but to my mind, that's really f quite efficient, 100 base pairs a second. It's just moving along. And if you go to WEHI, it's um, in Melbourne, there's the Walter and Eliza Hall, one of the great research institutes in Australia. Um, there are some computational biologists who also do animation. They're really good at artwork and computer animations. And they've got some animations of transcription happening. And they try and get this idea of 100 nucleotides a second and the polymerase shooting down the DNA. And it, it's really great animation to see after that big build-up, I don't actually have the animation to show you. Maybe during the break I'll try and find it online, but I can't guarantee. But anyway, there's some great... Um, if you do go browsing on YouTube to find these animations, look for ones from good places like the Weehi, the Walter and, Eli and Eliza Hall, because um, they do some great animations for this stuff. I think if you go to the Weehi site, um, they've got an animations page, and you can look at lots of processes which they've animated um, to try and make it look as realistic as they possibly can. <clears throat> okay, so when we talked about DNA replication, we talked about how it needs to be high fidelity because any mutations or incorrect bases that you introduce during DNA replication are fixed in time. They're going to they're going to live in the offspring and all cells that are made from that copy of the DNA will have that mutation in it, okay? So the, the um, DNA polymerase has to be really high fidelity. When you're making an RNA from a DNA molecule, <clears throat> it doesn't matter too much if you make a mistake every couple of thousand base pairs, because from one gene, say you're gonna make, you know, a thousand proteins, a thousand RNA transcripts which will make the proteins, if you make a, a mistake in one of those proteins, it doesn't really matter because that RNA will be around in the cell for microseconds or milliseconds or maybe a second or two whilst it's being translated and then it'll be digested away and then a new one's made from the gene. So you've got this continual turnover of, of RNAs being made, translated and degraded. So if, you get, if the RNA polymerase makes a mistake, it's not a real big consequence for the cell. So consequently, the RNA polymerase isn't, doesn't have as high fidelity as the DNA polymerase, okay? And so consequently, the, the RNA polymerase doesn't need to have this exact high fidelity. It hasn't got strong proofreading activity within the enzyme, okay? Because it doesn't need to be as high fidelity. So there's no pressure on it to be, be a high fidelity enzyme. So um, it has a higher rate of, should, I should have put the word error there, a high error rate 
So approximately one error every um, 10,000 or more ribonucleotides. Um, this is of less consequence to the cell because we make lots of transcripts and they're degraded and replaced from the, the, the DNA template. So if the DNA had a mistake, then all of the RNAs would have that mistake, so that matters in terms of DNA replication. But if an RNA is made with the wrong sequence, then it's simply degraded and remade as a natural process, so it doesn't really matter too much for the cell. Um, having said that, the RNA polymerase has a bit of activity to try and proofread. It's not true proofreading in the sense that it's not a catalytic site that's distinct from the polymerase site, which is the case for the DNA polymerase. It had a distinct um, domain, if you like, that, you could, you could, um, that was independent of, of where polymerization happened. But, um, but the RNA polymerase will actually pause when it comes across a, um, a mispaired DNA um, that's added, and then there's a process where that misplaced base, that incorrect base, can be um, removed. And it's effectively a reversal of the process of the polymerization. So um, I've got a diagram that tries to show that. So it's unclear whether this is a true proofreading function because it's not a separate activity from the polymerase function of the enzyme. So it's just a technical thing, but it's an important distinction between it and the DNA polymerase. Oh. Okay, so this slide's got a lot of information on it, and then once I've finished reading this slide, I then jump to the, the pictures. But I need to tell you what the pictures are about first. So this is from the textbook, and it, it's, got a, it's got a diagram that represents the process of um, trans and these big processes, they have an initiation phase, an elongation phase, and a termination phase. So you've got to start the process, make the molecule, stop the process. Okay? So we can think of, you know, um, all, so, so let's have a look at these processes. So I'll just read this off the slide for, uh, for first, then we'll look at the diagrams. So in terms of initiation, um, the polymerase has to bind to the promoter of the gene. Okay? And um, once it's bound, the DNA is still double-stranded DNA, and it hasn't opened up into the bubble yet. All right? And then once the polymerase is bound, it forms an open complex, meaning that you start to get this bubble, this opening up of the double-stranded um, DNA, and it's partially um, unwound um, to, to, to form this so that we can start transcription. And then once transcription is initiated, we then get um, a conformational change um, leading to um, the enzyme being in, in, in a complex that it can now start to elongate the, um, the, the, the RNA. And then once all of this process has occurred, the, um, the polymerase can actually start to move away from the promoter into the exon and read through the exons and introns until it gets to the end of the gene. So this is called, once it leaves the promoter, it's called promoter clearance. And pr promoter clearance involves the movement of the, you know, the polymerase and all of the other proteins that are involved away from the promoter. And um, it's tightly bound to the, um, the DNA at this stage. And the, the RNA polymerase um, becomes highly efficient at this stage. So it's difficult for the promoter to be cleared. It's difficult to add those first few nucleotides, but once it manages to clear the promoter, it's then a, an easy ride for the polymerase through the gene. And then um, that will then complete um, um, transcription, meaning it's a, um, a highly processive um, enzyme. And then when it gets to the end of the gene, it will dissociate from the DNA template. So that's the, um, the wordy bit. And you can see here there are five sections, five dot points here. I think there's a drawing for each dot point. So if you have a look at the textbook, it talks about this first point, which I've just mentioned, which is the RNA polymerase has to find the promoter and find the actual sequence of the promoter where transcription will begin. And at this point where it comes together, the DNA is still double-stranded. It's not as if the DNA has been opened up yet. 
Um, the next phase of um, initiation is the partial unwinding of the DNA, the formation of this bubble is starting to happen here. And then once you get the unwinding of the DNA, this is just, this purple bit here is the promoter region of the gene, and this is happening upstream of the transcription start. And then at some point we get um, the assembly of ribonucleotides in place at the promoter, promoter region of the DNA, you start to get extension of the RNA molecule, and then <clears throat> this, once you've made a little bit of RNA, you can then clear the promoter, and then you get this um, elongation phase of transcription, where the polymerase can happily read through the gene at 100 base pairs a second um, until it gets to the end of the gene. Um, oh, this is promoter clearance, so this is now the movement of the um, polymerase and the other proteins. Um, it's tightly bound to the, um, the, 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 the DNA and the RNA is tightly, you know, is bound here. And the um, RNA is, is highly efficient at this stage and, and moves through until it completes. And then at some point you get dissociation, once it's reached the end of the gene here, of the messenger RNA from the RNA polymerase. So I'm assuming this is RNA polymerase 2 and this is a messenger RNA. And this is being what's happening. So again, all those little bits of um, I've just shown you are summarized in this diagram here. So here we have the um, double-stranded DNA. Here's the promoter region. And then you get the assembly of the RNA polymerase at the pr promoter region here. Okay. Now, when we talked about the DNA polymerase, remember it's, it's got five subunits. It's got the alpha, the two alphas, the beta, the beta prime, and the omega. I remember there's a sixth bit of the polymerase called the sigma factor. Well, just shown here in the diagram is the sigma factor, because the sigma factor is important for the polymerase to recognize the promoter sequence here. So the sigma factor is involved. And also we get um, TFs, which unsurprisingly refer to transcription factors. So there's other um, um, proteins involved in helping the polymerase recognize a particular promoter sequence. And once that promoter sequence is recognized and you've got all the right things in place, you move from a closed um, structure here into an open structure where you get the formation of a transcription bubble, meaning the open DNA. And then <clears throat> from this, you get um, the initiation of um, the elongation phase, and then you get the promoter clearance, and then the promoter rushes through the gene and making the, the, the RNA here. And then at some point, you get to a region of the, the DNA sequence, which codes for the end of the gene. And then there's a, a, a few things that happen, which we're not going to discuss, which lead to the RNA exiting the polymerase. And then what you have here that you don't have in DNA replication is a cycle where the polymerase can then reattach to maybe the same gene again or another gene that codes for messenger RNAs and undergo another round of transcription. So you get one gene sequence here being transcribed again and again and again, depending on um, the control factors at the promoter. <clears throat> so we have some very efficient promoters and some fairly weak promoters and they will determine how many times and the rate at which um, transcription occurs. Okay, I'll take a short break now for 10 minutes because it's 5-2 and then um, we'll continue. I just had a quick look online. I just typed in um, um, WeHi and transcription. So WeHi being the Walter and Eliza Hall um, Institute, um, and Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, and then um, came up with this. So this is their animation of transcription. So
So um, you can see here the, um, the process of initiation takes quite a while. It was all, this, all the different factors of assembling. And I think that that's the sigma factor there. I can't, I've got my mouse, I can't point to it. Again, there's, and then at some point, it has to clear the promoter. So it hasn't cleared the promoter yet. So, um, so now it's cleared the promoter, and there it's, there it's moving to extend the RNA. And clearly, the RNA is is um, being sort of pushed out through this channel as this long um, single-stranded molecule. And the DNA is, remains double-stranded before and after the polymerase, but within the polymerase, you've got that replication bubble um, where it's opened up. And then, it does have volume as well, but it's just this sort of background kind of noise thing. Um, And there, this is actually quite a nice bit here. You can see that the DNA being s um, separated into to the two strands, individual strands here. So there's the bubble, and it's all about the structure of the polymerase that it functionally wraps around this, you know, is separated by this bit here. And then you can see the strand coming out. all the, um, the ribonucleotides coming into these channels into the um, catalytic center of the enzyme. So the RNA in eukaryotes has to go out of the nucleus to be translated. Okay, so, um, so if you get a, a chance, or if you're interested, then um, if you go to the, um, the WeHi site, e even the WeHi YouTube site's okay, and um, they've got a bunch of animations for different biological processes. So they get grants from the government, from the NHMRC or ARC, and they've got some postdocs in there <coughs> who are good at both computation, computational skills with animations and understand biology. And they do these animations. <coughs> and they also link to some other good sources of information who also have a YouTube presence, such as Nature Magazine have a YouTube presence, TED Talks, um, the DNA Learning Center, and a whole bunch of other places. So, I know YouTube is full of cats and dogs and, you know, all these things which we all enjoy and, you know, we need our recreational cats to play pianos and dogs to howl and sing along to melodies and stuff. But there's also some good resources on YouTube. So if you do go on to YouTube to get some background information, I recommend you go to somewhere like the WeHi to get your information, not just a random search and then just click on something a random person's done. You know, go to these people who... Um, have a very strong um, knowledge base. Anyway, getting back to the lecture. All right. So this is in a non-animated form, that same process. This is um, transcription. Um, and so when we talk about the RNA polymerase, we say it's processive. So when we talked about DNA polymerase, it, it could either be um, processive synthesis or distributive synthesis. Processive is where one polymerase is running along from nucleotide to nucleotide, and distributive is where the polymerase leaves and another one comes and reattaches. So we get this thing. But RNA synthesis, once it gets into the gene and starts reading the um, exons and introns, once it's cleared the promoter, it's processive. And typically, it will extend all the way until the end of the gene. It doesn't fall off and then reattach. And I think it's because as you saw in that movie, the DNA is actually intertwined around the molecule a lot more, so it's, it's, so it's much harder for the molecule to fall off. Um, so the kinetics of the polymerization greatly favor the addition of the next nucleotide over the release of the transcript.
All right, so, um, so transcription forms part of this process which we mentioned earlier of gene expression. And gene expression means going from the DNA, information content in the DNA, to the expressed form of that information, such as in a protein. Okay? So the, clearly once you transcribe something and you make the messenger RNA, that messenger RNA is going to leave into the cytosol in, in um, eukaryotes and be translated. So it's a huge energy cost wants to, to make a transcript and then move it into the cytosol and then to translate that into a protein. It's a, it's a huge energy cost for the cell. So the control of this whole process of gene expression, there's lots of control points, but one of the major control points is actually at the initiation of transcription because it's the first step in a lot of processes that uses a lot of energy and it makes... Um, but so, um, so a lot of protein exp you know, um, synthesis and gene exp expression is, is controlled at the, rate of, at the stage of um, transcription. So much of the regulation of, of protein levels occurs at the transcriptional stage, and it's the initiation of transcription that's an important um, control point. And um, as we were saying before, transcription is the first stage of protein synthesis. You put it all together, and we refer, we, we, we refer to that as gene expression. Um, and the regulation of transcription is basically at the promoter binding st stages. So where the polymerase binds to the, the promoters, that's an important um, part of the regulation of transcription. So, um, so this gets us back now to looking at the sigma factor that I was highlighting earlier, that the sixth bit of the DNA that is transiently associated with the DNA. And I was saying that the sigma factor um, is important in recognizing the promoter elements. So um, the, the most common sigma factor, meaning there's a lot of different sigma factors in the cell, the most common sigma factor that we're going to talk about first, and this is in the E. coli, is sigma factor 70. Um, they're not named 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 70. I'm, I'm guessing it has something to do with the way you purify sigma factors from cells. It's probably got a sedimentation coefficient of 70 or some weird thing like that. So it's a big thing, all right? And it's um, a big, big protein. So anyway, we've got the sigma factor 70. I'm not, I'm not sure why it's called 70. And um, this is part of the RNA hollow enzyme, the RNA polymerase hollow enzyme. So it's, and um, the sigma factor tends to recognize sequences of DNA. So it's a DNA binding protein. It recognizes sequences of DNA that typically are within the promoter region of a gene and that there are between 10 or 35 base pairs away from the start of transcription. So within a promoter sequence of a gene, um, so you've got promoter sequences and you've got the exons and the gene sequences. I think we know from our understanding of biology that exon sequences are highly conserved between organisms. So if, if I code for a protein that's been conserved over evolution, then yeast will code for that protein, and it's still recognizable as being that same protein because those gene exons have been highly conserved, so otherwise the protein doesn't fold up properly. So you get small changes, but it's, it's basically highly conserved. Promoter regions tend not to be as highly conserved as exons, but there are regions within promoters that are highly conserved. So when you align promoter sequences together and you identify regions, well, you align them by working out where the start of transcription is. So if you align the sequences that are upstream you know, from the exons, you know, in the promoter region there, you'll identify sequences that are still conserved within promoter regions of many, many genes. And these, these conserved regions occur at about 10, minus 10 from the start site and minus 35 from the start site. And I've got a diagram that shows that. I think it's here, actually. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so, and th so there tends to be these conserved sequences in the promoters. And it's these conserved sequences that the sigma factor, the sigma factors can recognize. So, for instance, the sigma factor 70 recognizes these two sequences. So, a little bit on the naming here. 
plus one, if you're a molecular biologist, then you see that bendy arrow there? That means something to molecular biologists. That means start of transcription. We just know what that is. In the same way that we write DNA 5 prime to 3 prime without thinking about it, when we see a bendy arrow on a, on a gene sequence, we go, oh, start of transcription. Okay? Now, start of transcription is always referred to as plus one. That first nucleotide is plus one. If this were primary school maths, we would go plus one, and then we, as we go into the promoter here, we go into negative territory. And as we go into the exon, we go into the plus territory. So we go plus two, plus three, plus four nucleotides into the exon, and we go negative bases into the promoter. But there is no zero in molecular biology maths. We just go plus one, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. So I don't know what it is about molecular biologists and maths. Maybe we just flunked maths and decided to do molecular biology instead. But if you go um, minus 10 from the start of transcription, in, so we're going into the promoter here, a region's about minus 10. There's a, 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 a AT rich region here. And if you go minus 35 from the start of transcription, there's a, another conserved <coughs> region here. And there's a spacer region between the two. And it's also the number of bases in this spacer region here that's important as well. So it's, it's the geometric location of the plus 10 and plus 35 sites. So there's a bit of movement in those regions as well. So if you've got um, this particular orientation, then that particular promoter region will be well recognized by sigma factor 70, which will bring in the RNA polymerase 2 to, to transcribe that particular exon. And because it's sigma factor 70 and it's RNA polymerase 2, then you're going to have a gene sequence here. Okay? So the promoter sequence here is an important in regulating the initiation of transcription through these um, sequences here. And again, if you think about this little tartar box here, this little region here, between T's and A's on opposite strands of the DNA, you don't have strong um, hydrogen bonding because you've only got two, base, two Watson Creek um, hydrogen bonds between complementary bases. So this is probably quite easy to start to unravel and start to form that bubble. So um, just reading the slide here. Um, most common sigma factors, such as the sigma factor 70, um, recognize a, a promoter such as this. Um, sequences around minus 10 and minus 35, named from the start of transcription, um, are important consensus sequences. So if you line up lots of these promoters, you tend to have these regions conserved, whereas the, the bases at these regions here are not highly conserved. Um, sometimes you also see this upstream um, AT-rich element, which is also important for um, triggering promoter clearance and stuff. And I think in that, even in that animation, at one point, if you noticed, you didn't notice it, but the upstream region sort of came into contact and then the promoter left. So th the guys at WeHi tried to include the upstream element in promoter clearance as well. So, um, so in these promoters um, of, of highly expressed genes, um, you often see this upstream region here. So, so now what we're trying to do is put together our knowledge of the RNA polymerase and the initiation of transcription and start to actually consider the gene sequences um, that are involved. So here's the sigma factor 70 shown associated with the RNA polymerase. So this is the RNA hollow enzyme with its five subunits and its sixth subunit attached here. And it looks like there are two sigma factors attached here. One recognizes this consensus sequence at minus 10, and the other one is going to recognize this consensus sequence at minus 35. And then that starts to bind and wrap the DNA around the, um, the, the polymerase. Um, <clears throat> this is a table from the textbook, and this table is just looking at some of these sigma factors that are known to occur in E. coli. So we've been looking at sigma factor 70 for highly expressed genes, and I need my glasses for this. So, um, so what we have here is um, 
sigma factor 70 is important in regulating what, what's called housekeeping genes. So if you think about a cell, within an E. coli cell or an e eukaryotic cell, you've got some genes that are just needed to be expressed all the time as, as part of the normal functioning of a cell. Okay? So these genes that are basically just constantly being expressed, they're not turned off, they're not turned on, they're just always being expressed at this high level. Um, they're, they're called housekeeping, so they're not highly regulated by other transcription factors, and these housekeeping genes contain these consensus sequences here. So if you look at E. coli, you identify the genes that are expressed constitutively as housekeeping genes that are always on, always on at fairly high rates. You get those genes, you align the start of the exon of all of those genes, and you look at the promoters of all of those genes that have the similar expression profile, that's when you can observe these consensus sequences between the promoters. If you just take genes generally and just clump them together and look for consensus sequences, you don't see much, but when you get genes and you group them by their expression levels and then you align them, that's when you see the consensus sequences. Okay? So they've identified through some smart bioinformatics that when you look at genes that have the similar expression profile as housekeeping genes, you look at the promoters, you then notice these consensus sequences and a space or region between them of between 16 and 18 base pairs. Okay? Now, there are other genes in, in cells which are referred to as responsive genes. So sometimes a cell, if you're looking at E. coli, a really simple example, the cell might come into contact with a sugar that wasn't there previously. And in response to that sugar, it turns on genes so it can metabolize that sugar. So they're not housekeeping genes, they're genes that are in response to a particular thing in the environment. All right? And then when you sort of look at genes that respond to the same environmental trigger, whether it be a, a change in heat or a particular sugar or a particular toxin or something in the environment that the cell responds to in a controlled way, and then you look at the genes that are turned on, and then you get those gene sequences and you look at the promoter sequences of those genes that were turned on, you'll see consensus sequences in those genes, meaning the same factors are turning them on. And what they've what this said here is that if you look at genes that are turned on or regulated in response to starvation, then they've got a particular sequence at about minus 10, but there's no consensus sequence at minus 35. If you look at genes that are involved in the flagella structure and movement, so they know what genes need to be made to make a flagella, then you see a slightly different consensus sequence here and a smaller spacing between these consensus sequences. So different consensus sequences and a different spacing. If you heat shock E. coli, it's a really simple experiment. You get E. coli, it likes to be at 37 degrees. You just quickly put it in a 42 degree bath. You heat shock it and then you look at what genes were turned on. So genes turned on in response to the environment. And again, you align all of those genes and look at the promoter region of those genes and you'll see there are two consensus sequences which are distinct from the housekeeping genes with a different space of difference. And then you can do that for all different sorts of responses. So, so by, by treating cells in the you know, and then identifying which genes are turned on and then looking at the promoters of those genes, you can identify conserved regions in the promoters which tell you that's where something's binding and that's where something is involved in regulating that promoter. So that's a fairly long diatribe on a fairly simple table. I don't expect you to know all that, but I think it's important to have a, an appreciation that promoter regions are really important in regulating genes and people are starting to understand the sequences in promoters that are conserved, and, it's this, and if you can identify conserved sequences, that's typically where transcription factors or sigma factors or things are binding to those promoters. All right, moving on. So what do we have here? Um, okay, so, um, so once the promoter's bound to the double-stranded DNA through these sigma factors, and it's identified the right region to bind to, you then get the formation of um, an open um, um, complex. Um, so the DNA starts to get opened. 
And um, so the hollow enzyme binds to the promoter at, when it's a closed com complex, and then at some point, the, um, the, you get this, this opening of the, 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 of the double-stranded DNA. And I think there's a diagram here somewhere. Yeah, there's a nice little diagram here. So this is showing the, um, the RNA polymerase binding to the DNA. It's starting to open up the DNA here. And what's happening here is it's starting to initiate the process of transcription. And I've been trying to, get, trying to mention to you that if you remember, transcription can begin without a primer. Okay? So there's, um, there's no primer sequence of, of DNA here. So you've got just the two naked strands of, um, of, of the DNA, and there's no, nothing attached to either of those two strands. And this polymerase can take, and I've, I've described this to you already, it can take individual nucleotides and even though there's only you know, two base pairs between an A and T and three between the GC, you can actually manage to hold them in place and at the same time form that bond, that sugar phosphate bond between the two of them, and then it can hold another one. But because there's only a couple of nucleotides in place, it's very easy thermodynamically for those nucleotides to just drift off because it's not tightly bound. So it's quite a difficult procedure for the enzyme to carry out so the textbook's showing here this circular action here. So before you get promoter cle clearance, you get the enzyme trying to add these few nucleotides, and then at some point it fails and it goes back because that bit of RNA just drifts off. And then it has to start again and try and make those sugar phosphate bonds between two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten base pairs until it can it repeats this a few times with these small bits of RNA just not being bound strongly enough up until the point where it's got enough bound that it's fairly stable and it can start to leave the promoter and go into the exon and read the gene. So, um, so this is sort of trying to get the, you know, form this, this um, strand of RNA here. So w once it, it, it's successful at initiating, it can then run into the promoter and then um, you know, the polymerase can read into the gene. So, um, so the RNA polymerase must bind two nucleotides in place at the double-stranded, at at this, at this, the, the, on the DNA template, um, and then between those two nucleotides has to form the bond and then carry on. So that's very different from the DNA polymerase that can't do that. So the DNA polymerase Polymerase relies on another enzyme called primase to initiate um, the making of that primer, which the DNA polymerase can then extend. So, so now you have um, a nice, a fairly tightly bond, bound bit of RNA. It's also coming out the channel, which probably helps stabilize it, and then it can then begin to extend that th free three prime end of the RNA to make um, the, the RNA molecule. So, um, so after a successful initiation, um, what we mean by that is that the polymerase can actually hold on to the transcript for long enough to extend it to about 10 nucleotides in length. And when it becomes 10 nucleotides, you've got 10 um, lots of um, Watson Creek base pairing between 10 complementary um, nucleotides that are attached and joined together, and that's fairly stable. And then you can enter the elongation phase and then it's highly processive. The enzyme doesn't fall off until it reaches the termination signal in the, in the gene. Um, I've already said this, but um, transcription is continuous until termination. So in this mode, the polymerase is what we call processive rather than distributive. So one enzyme is able to proceed and, and, and um, replicate the entire gene. And it moves smoothly along the template, um, synthesizing the, the RNA um, through to completion. During the process of elongation, there's only ever, I think I've already sh said this, there's only ever eight or nine nucleotides that, of, of RNA that remain base, base paired to the DNA template. So I think it's, it's fairly obvious that um, at this region here, if I can get the mouse, where um, the, D, the RNA is being extended, there's only eight or nine base pair, 
there's only eight or nine nucleotides that are actually base pairing the rest. So as new nucleotides are added at the three prime end, the single-stranded RNA is peeled off from the molecule, um, physically um, peeled off through a different channel. So the rest of the transcript is stripped off and directed out through the RNA exit channel. And all right, so. We've, I've talked to you about the fidelity of the RNA polymerase, saying it's not high fidelity compared to the DNA polymerase. It doesn't have um, a dedicated proofreading site. It hasn't got a catalytic site that's distinct from the polymerase site, but it's got the ability to um, you know, repair a few mistakes. So the, the catalytic reaction it actually runs in reverse. Um, so w once incorrect base pairs are added, um, it causes the polymerase to stall. And then once the polymerase has stalled, if it can stall for long enough, then you get this process called um, um, pyrophosphorylysis. So the pyrophosphate, which is, so you've got incoming trinucleotide. It's got three phosphate groups attached. The alpha phosphate, meaning the first one closest to the nucleotide, is attached to the three prime. Because getting back to that diagram, the incoming nucleotide has the triphosphates attached to the five prime of the sugar. Okay? And then the alpha group of the nucleotide is attached to the three prime of the existing strand. So two phosphates leave. And that's called pyrophosphate. If the wrong nucleotide is incorporated, this pyrophosphate um, can actually attack the bond and, and, and break the bond. So there's a diagram here. So, so at the top here, we've got the DNA template strand. And then we've got the correct base pairing of an extension of the RNA, which is this green strand here. But at some point, you've got C should be attached to a G. But at some point, a C is attached to a U. So the wrong nucleotide's been added the wrong nucleotide has been added to the growing strand and this causes the polymerase to, to pause and whilst it pauses through a process that isn't described in any detail in the textbook the pyrophosphate that's cleaved off can actually come in and break that bond so by stalling the polymerase allows this second process to occur and then the pyrophosphate cleaves the bond so that you're back to the correctly um, bonded um, what would be an AT because it's RNA, it's AU, so you've got this, this bond here, and then th the correct incoming nucleotide can then be added. So strictly speaking, it's not a, a distinct proofreading activity of the enzyme, it's a pausing of the enzyme, and then the pyrophosphate can come in and do something and cause the, um, a, the, a, a repair and the removal of that nucleotide. Um, Confusingly for us, there's a second mechanism of proofreading for RNA polymerase. And this is called nucleolytic proofreading. So the RNA polymerase contains an inherent nuclease activity as well. I don't think it's a distinct nuclease activity. I think it's just... Uh, but anyway, so the, 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 the newly, so this nuclease activity can correct um, the the newly synthesized strand and cleave off the incorrect base. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't just cleave off the end base, it cleaves off a small fragment of the RNA molecule. And I've got a diagram that shows this. So the polymerase reverses itself by one or a few nucleotides, and then it can break the incorrect base pair, and then it can um, continue its merry way. So again, there's a diagram here. Um, so um, at some point here. So if you're reading along the RNA strand, which is the bottom strand here, you've got the correct base pairing up until you've got a CU rather than a CG. Okay, and then you've got a, some, some correct bases here, but because of this incorrect base pair here, you're not getting proper um, base pairing here, which causes the um, polymerase to stop and I think it actually says the polymerase reverses direction. So the polymerase pauses because of that incorrect base pair and then reverses direction by a few nucleotides. 
and then it cleaves off um, through some nucleus activity involving water, it cleaves where the er error was and it cleaves off a fragment of the, um, the RNA. So these correct ones are removed as well as the incorrect one and then synthesis can reform with the correct nucleotides here. So again it's not, um, it's a different proofreading to the DNA polymerase, it's more a reversal of the, the enzyme. So it hasn't got a distinct site that carries out proofreading but it's got two mechanisms where it can pause and then either reverse or somehow remove the incorrect nucleotide. And um, as I said, the, the RNA polymerase isn't as um, high fidelity as DNA polymerase, so it's still less accurate. Um, DNA polymerase makes an error about one in um, a million base pairs. RNA polymerase about one in, um, is that 10,000 um, nucleotides? So depending on the length of the gene, that might, might, that might be one error per gene. So for each transcript, it might be one error. Um, depending on where the error is, it may or may not have any consequence at all. But that RNA polymerase that's made will only be transiently expressed in the cell, trans transiently translated, and then degraded, and a new one will be made. And it's very unlikely that the new one will have the error at the same point. So even if it was in, in a key sequence, it was, it's a transient error. So many copies are made, and the, um, if there are errors in proteins or they are vastly outnumbered by the correct sequences. And last slide, I used to have a bunch of slides here but I've kind of taken out because it was just too much detail. But we've got initiation, we've got elongation and for all of these processes we've got termination. So there's, um, a, few, there's a few hypotheses running around of how termination is, how it physically occurs, what's the mechanism that causes gene um, transcription to stop and um, that there are sequences that have been identified that are involved in um, terminating transcription. So certain sequences in the DNA template that cause the polymerase to um, stop and release its, um, its um, transcript. It has something to do with hairpin loops forming. So you get these region here that's complementary here and then it can fold back on itself and cause process to happen. Um, the, 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 this mechanism is broken up into two categories. There's a, there's a row independent termination sequence and a row dependent um, t t t termination process. So, so sometimes a factor called the, this, this row factor can be involved in terminating um, transcription and sometimes it's not involved in, in terminating depending on the sequence of the, of the gene and the template DNA. So just to, to be aware that there's a process of, of transcription termination as well, which finishes off the cycle. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention. And um, brace yourselves. And I'll see you next week. But if you've got any questions, feel free to come up and have a chat. Okay, thanks.